John Trokeman and his brother David originally formed Militia of Montana in 1994. From the beginning, it served its purpose by educating and preparing people to protect and defend their lives, liberties, and property. John has been an active force in bringing attention to the vital significance of local militia. He travels extensively to promote survival and militia readiness. His quiet demeanor and strong presence are qualities frequently sought during numerous police negotiation situations. John is a man of principle, courage, and God, and a man of the earth. His knowledge and organizational skills ensure his continued presence whenever the conversation turns to truth, justice, and liberty. It's always a pleasure having him here. Let's welcome back John Trokeman to the Global Freedom Report. What I wanted to get a sense of is if you could give a characterization of the overall environment in the U.S. How has 2011 been for liberty and justice? Uh, you know, and, and you know, just the overall environment. Give us a summary just to start this discussion. I would be glad to. Uh, well, first off, I've been praying for pain because pain makes people uncomfortable and makes them jump off the fence one side or the other, which has been happening. There's plenty of pain out there. And the two sides that seem to be surfacing are the environmental wackos and those that are in, in the uh, peace officer business that have sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution, those that have supported oath keepers, uh, the Western State Sheriff's Alliance uh, has come very much alive. They're going to have a conference in uh, Las Vegas in, on January 30th, and a lot of them from Western States, all the Western States will be attending, including our sheriff here from Sanders County, Montana. The big thing we face right now is the attacks by all of these globalists. We have 170-some different global organizations here in Montana, from Alliance to the Wild Rockies, the Land Council, Cabinet Resource Group, Bear Management Foundation, and they're putting these management uh, operations right over the top of us in little tiny Knox in Montana, here in Montana, Trot Creek. Each have their own bear management units, which is if you try to do anything with these bears, they have collars on them, and if you plug one of them and the heart stops, there will be a satellite over the top of you instantly to take your pictures and call out the game warden instantly. A friend of mine had what, that what, what, if you, what if you plug one of the federal game wardens? What if you what? What if you plug one of the federal game wardens? Well, the local game warden here um, is caught between a rock and a hard place. He wants to stay in there long enough to retire. He agrees with us that this is a terrible problem, but he's caught between the rock and a hard place for his paycheck, which is not correct. No, I, but we have yeah, done other I, things. I, I was uh, being somewhat facetious, but only somewhat uh, with that. Um, is, is your brother still involved with Militia of Montana? We both are. We do gun shows both almost are. every weekend across the Northwest. We talk yeah, to people, been, we send yeah, out it's newsletters it's, and it's, books. It's been 17 years, going on, going on, hopefully, going on 50. Um, you know, how is Militia of Montana in terms of you know, people's involvement? We have never had uh, a membership list ever, contrary to the Southern Poverty Law Center or all the federal agencies that rub shoulders with them. We have never done that. We don't expose people at all. We never have. Our mission statement is exactly the same today as it was in early 1994 when we started MOM. But MOM is still considered to be a militia. So, I mean, uh, I understand that you don't have any official lists or anything, but do you have a sense of the support that the militia has? The amount of participation, is has it grown? You know, are people getting scared and getting less involved? Uh, for you federal agents that are listening, absolutely. We are growing by leaps and bounds. It's nice and quiet. It's just like the art of war says, know the enemy without them knowing you. People are growing all across America. During the 90s, when I met you, Brent, uh, uh, I had two, two speeches at the preparedness expos. One was what the problem is, and the other one was getting prepared. And in getting prepared, I had showed the checklist and the cell structure system of how to organize. Well, Johnny Appleseed here has spread this by tens of thousands of copies of it all across America, and there are sweet little units everywhere. Government, you figure it out. Very nice. By the way, years ago, probably 20 years ago, I wrote a, uh, an article for a newsletter called Discomfort, the Great Motivator, in which I basically said what you said, you know, not just pain, but when people are out of their comfort zone, it really does motivate them heavily much more than when they're in it. So I, I, I approve of, of what you said about praying for, uh, for pain. Um, 
How about, you know, I, and again, I, I, I understand, I've read The Art of War more than once. I understand strategy. Um, so please understand my sensitivity to that when I ask this question. What about the general condition of state and local militia groups throughout the United States, as far as you know? The, uh, the name is shifting to the sheriff's posse. Here in Montana, it is impossible to start an armed militia and take them out and train them because of state laws. If three or more people gather together with Tammy clothes on, go out to train with rifles, they can all go to prison. So if you want to train, you have to do one thing at a time. You go out and target practice, or you go out and do your skills as uh, camping out or as cold weather survival or whatever it happens to be, especially like communications. We do that. We do it very well here, uh, undetected, hopefully. Uh, but we can do all these things one at a time. But when we're called out as a posse under the sheriff, which is being organized now all across the western state, it's part of the meetings that they're having in Las Vegas for the sheriff that attend. Uh, so um, the names may be changed, but we are still the same. Now, I'm curious, if, if, if is the sheriff's gathering this particular, the answer to this particular question? Because several weeks ago, we invited you to come on the show, and at the time you expressed no small amount of frustration and disappointment with the American sheeple, and I share it. Um, now, last week, because we wanted to have you on during our final week of broadcast uh, here, um, you sounded almost rejuvenated. What has happened between when we spoke to you a few weeks back and now to bring hope back to John Trokman? I was sitting with my sheriff uh, in a meeting. We have a little organization called Sanders Natural Resource Council, uh, which is going after the Forest Service, uh, bringing a lawsuit against them right now. And it just so happened that our sheriff attended the meeting, and I gave him a MOM calendar, and a Militia Montana calendar. It's a freedom calendar that we handle. And on the back of it, it, it says our name. And, and he says, uh, I said to him, I, I said, Tom, you perhaps only want only want one because of, you don't want to put it up in your office because of the name that's on the back. And he looks at the name on the back. He puts his finger over Montana. He says, I wish it said Militia of Sanders County. So that gave us a little hope. But what he's trying to put together, and we're working with him, uh, starting with uh, a number of uh, veterans and CCW carriers uh, to be under him as his posse. And that's the safest way to do it until the sheriff gains some ground here to know how to operate properly, and we're helping with that also. And that's why we're sending him to this informational center. Sheriff Richard Mack is putting it on, and that should give you a clue as to how well it will be organized. Oh, yeah, we had Richard on last week, and I, I personally am, uh, am contributing as much as I can uh, to get at least one sheriff of, you know, by me in there. Um, right. You know, and and I'm asking everybody, this is something to contribute to. So, yeah, I'm excited about this also. But let's talk a little bit about this sheriff's gathering. And he's, you know, uh, shooting for 200 sheriffs. And there are, what, 32, 3,400 sheriffs in the country. And more and more are learning about their authority and their power to basically kick federal thugs out of their county. Do you believe that this genuinely has the ability to... I absolutely um, do. Absolutely. I don't know if turn the tide, but at least, to, you know, to, to arm the freedom fighters with something that can really work to push back the tyrants. Um, we are working on the paperwork uh, right now as, you, as we speak to have the sheriff coordinate with federal agencies that are shutting off roads in our county. They're putting all these animals in to eat up what's left of our prey out there. Um, I think it's but working very the, well. I think I see light at the, the end of the tunnel for a change. Are the sheriffs can actually go out and arrest those people who are under federal authority blocking the roads, say, fine, in my county, you're going to jail, and the roads are unblocked. Are they actually going to do that? And if so, somewhere down the line, we're going to have a confrontation. Absolutely. That's what it's all headed to is a confrontation, better sooner than later. It's going to happen that way. There's no doubt about it. Happening. Thank you, pardon. Well, I just you know, ha let, let's let's play a little fantasy land here. 
Okay, you got it, because it's happening a lot. The, uh, the uh, you know, land management people are in there closing roads, like you said. Okay, so the sheriff comes out and says, look, okay, if I've told you before to get out of here. You haven't gotten out of here. I'm now going to arrest you. Puts him in cuffs, takes him to jail, removes their vehicles blocking the road, opens the road. What happens next? Federal agents come in to arrest the sheriff and take him away, charge him with at least four felonies under the federal law. But the sheriff, knowing his rights, doesn't have to allow that to happen, and that's where the posse comes in to defend the sheriff. He's got to have people around him. Our sheriff is looking for 300 guys around him here. We only have nine active deputies, and they're not going to do much with all the federal hordes that come in. So uh, where did federal agents get the authority to arrest a sheriff in his own county? They don't have the authority. They just assume the authority, and the people are believing it. I want to read you a little something here. We've handed out something called Occupation, How to Survive and Begin to Counter the Initial Three to Six Months of Invasion. If and when an occupation occurs, the uniforms worn will likely be recognizable and perceived as the good guys. By well-conditioned citizens, initially armed resistance without a biological support network will be borderline suicidal. Brent, that's why we're doing what we're doing now. We've done everything we can through the militia movement to try to educate people. That's why I've been in the past praying for pain. Here's, here's where things are headed now in our area uh, with all the, the land and the mineral wealth and the uh, airlines being taken over. Everything everywhere is being taken over right now by the federal government. We have government motors instead of general motors. All the airlines are now in receivership. Uh, and it's just like I want to read you a little something here, and you tell me where it comes from. The land, its mineral wealth, waters, forests, mills, factories, mines, rail, water, and air transport, banks, communication, large state-organized agricultural enterprises, as well as municipal enterprises, and the bulk of dwelling houses in the cities and industrial locations are state property, that is, belonging to the whole people. That is Article 6 of the Communist Constitution, written in English, 1947, Moscow. I just read it out of that book. Are we any different wow. today? Wow. No, I, there, I, I, I couldn't place that. That's good. That's good. Wow. I've been looking for that book for years, and somebody came along at the last gun show in Spokane and said, John, I'd like you to take this to your hotel and go through it and give it back to me Sunday night. Well, Sunday night came, and I had a real tough time giving it back, so I had $25 in one hand and said, sir, I do radio shows. I could sure use this document. And he says, bows his head, and he says, oh, all right. He took the $25. So I've got this old ragged book now. Wow, that's terrific. That's tremendous. Hey, what do you think about the Occupy movement? Uh, yes, it's bad, and no, it's good. It's very mixed. Uh, I have an eternal student, eternal student meaning that he's been a student since I met him in 94 uh, at a Purdue University in Indiana. He's a, a Chinese boy. His mom went through the purge in China, and she says, we are in year two, in the end of year two of five years of bloodshed. And he gives me reports on what goes on on the campus there, including red shirts with black fists on them and people bragging about how they've gotten paid by the George Soros Foundation and the Occupy Movement uh, and the Communist Party to continue on. And he says they're telling him when the weather gets too tough, the leaders of those groups will be taken out for training. So in the spring, when they come back, they'll be extremely professional. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like strange bedfellows kind of thing. I can't, Absolutely. I can't no. oppose that when they're going after the banksters, but I, too, believe that this is a Marxist, uh, a, a definite Marxist organization. Well, absolutely. Well, here's, let me read something else here. The economic foundation of the USSR is socialist system of economy and the socialist ownership of the instruments and means of production, firmly established as a result of the liquidation of the capitalist system of economy, the abolition of private ownership, of the instruments and means of production and the elimination and the exploitation of man by man. Yeah, and, and it's, not what very doing now? Like the, it's very much like the Bolshevik rousing the workers of the world type thing as well. It's very well, similar. Here's, a, here's another little document. It's called Local Government Partners with Environmentalist Organizations to Control Private Property. Reed F. Noss, founder of the Wildlands Project, has made several statements against human population of the earth, such as the collective needs of non-human species must take precedence over the needs and desires of humans. And if we are to succeed, it is not enough to come after control of public land 
we must also take control of private land as well. And that's what they're trying to do right in our country right now. The commissioners have invited, invited FEMA in, and when FEMA comes in during a disaster, like, say, wildfires, uh, they will empty all the homes, take all the guns, uh, and places under martial law, and chances are allow the fire to come through and relocate us in another state, just like they did in Louisiana to Texas. Now, I love the idea of sheriff's posses, but I have a basic problem when you come under a sheriff and therefore you have to, it's, there's a command structure that however, um, if the sheriff is not everything he's supposed to be, it can work against the will of the people. The uh, reason I'm saying this is because during the Occupy protest, there have been numerous incidents in which picked thug cops, and I use that term to describe them by their actions, have assaulted, battered, and even murdered peaceful protesters. When well, this happens, what's the proper role of militia members? What's the proper role of people who meet, uh, have committed to doing something? We are well aware that we can't take care of the problems by ourselves. Here. When there's chaos in one little tiny area, Brent, we're screwed. If there's chaos all across America at once, we have a wonderful chance of redeeming things properly. Our sheriff, I trust him 100% with my life. In the event something happens to our sheriff and some of the undersheriff people were to take charge, we could have a real problem here. But we are military enough guys to know exactly what to do. There no, are, no, but, this yeah, county, me, this county is, is 10,000 yeah. people strong here. 10,000 people strong. 2,000 of us are veterans in this county. No, so we have 20% yeah, here. That's uh, our let, people. Let me, let me try and explain a little differently, okay? Let's say you were in Oakland. Okay, you were in Oakland, okay, when the pig cops started to batter and abuse and shoot people. Or, or let's say that uh, we just did a story about cops bashing an intoxicated man's head into the pavement and then taking him to jail just because he was drunk. Just because he was drunk. Um, now, you were there. You're witnessing that. What, at what point do you get up and start saying, okay, it's time for me to bash the cop's head into the, into the pavement. It's time for me to disarm this guy and shoot him. When is that? When is it? Playing? Well, in the first place, I'd never be in Oakland. A city is a is a unnatural system to be in. There is no way of defending a city. But you understand my point. It's like I absolutely you encounter do. But these that things. is that is a condition that is a no win situation. I would never put myself in that situation. What are we supposed to do when we witness these things happening to you know right around us? Are we supposed to just turn our heads away? Who controls these people? You know, it's not the cops um, um, that are totally guilty of this. It's the people that send them out with the authority to do certain things and then don't prosecute them if they disobey and they harm people. So the people that need to pay this price are the people that control the cops. There's where the visit should be, whether it's during work hours or not. That's all I'm going to say that way. Okay, I will respect that, though I, I, I still feel that even if they're just following orders, they're responsible for their actions. And I have a, they I have a poem no. that was talked to me, Brent, by an elderly gentleman that's now passed away. It goes like this. Captain, what do you think I ask of the part your soldiers play? The captain answered, I do not think, I do not think I obey. Do you think it is right to shoot a patriot down and help a tyrant slay? The captain answered, I do not think, I do not think I obey. Then if this is your soldier's, soldier's coat, I cried, you're a mean, unmanly crew. And for all of your feathers and gilded and braid, I'm more of a man than you. For well, whatever my lot in life may be, and whether I swim or sink, I can say with pride, I do not obey, I do not obey, I think. Brent, we have to learn to pick our fight. Very good. Very good. How do people learn to choose your battles wisely, is what you're saying. And I, I've been telling people that for years as well. How, how do people learn more about, like, what do you do if people these days come up and say, Hey, John, I want to get involved with the militia. What do you tell them? Well, it, most often the question is, uh, I've called the militia for help. What are you going to do for me? And I say, sir, look in the mirror. What have you done for yourself? You haven't kept up the payments of freedom called eternal vigilance. You haven't made the payments. How come? You're busy investing in ball worship and every other stupid thing that you can fill your head with sawdust with. Why don't you pay the price and learn what's going on and then rally your people around you? How do you expect me to send you in Ohio when I'm in Montana? I can't cross state lines to help you. I have to stay in my own state or I have broken law. So people have to learn to defend people themselves. People right? want to be helped rather than people who want to contribute. 
Well, we send them information as to how to organize. Um, we put them in touch with people in their areas to organize with people of like mind, but we warn them that one out of every five that wants to get involved is an agent or a provocateur. A provocateur usually is someone that has done something stupid that is uh, either goes to prison or sets us up and sells us off to keep himself out of prison. One out of five. One out of five. I think that's generous, actually. I wouldn't be surprised if it was more than that, but I'll, I'll take your word on it. Michael, calling in from somewhere in America. Michael, you're on the, uh, except not Washington, D.C. You're on the line, Michael, with John Trokman. Good afternoon, Brett and John. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the both of you gentlemen for bringing to the forefront the, the issues that you do. And hopefully some of these people in across our country that are standing on the sidelines will wake up and realize that there's a whole lot more pain coming their way. And it seems like you say, John, pain is the universal language and it's the only thing that's going to make them uh, go into action and respond in the way that we need to to retain our freedoms. Amen. Uh, John, you were, you were speaking about how they, George Soros, and his crew are, are supporting these people in this so-called Washington Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, one of the things that I see going on is that people are becoming so despondent and so poor that they're looking at this as, well, this is a way to feed my family. And what's happening, from what I can see, is the same things that happened back during the Volkovich Bolko Revolution. Uh, in the end, it's going to be where they start rounding up everybody that has spoken out, and sooner or later, it's going to come right down to where they grab the average guy, too, because their goal through their Agenda 21, they've already stated that they're out to kill the common person but through population elimination. Uh, how, how do you think, John, that, that we can get this message out to more Americans and get this message out to more sheriffs so that we can get more people standing up and saying enough's enough. We're just not going to take any more of, of your of your slavery. John? I believe the best way is to get people that have money to start putting some on the line. Uh, paying for signs to, uh, to put people in touch with people. Uh, buying ads and papers. Um, getting on talk shows themselves or uh, buying time for people like us to get on shows to express the concerns that we have to show people how to rally. Uh, you know, when, when we had all these meetings across the country, I've got three Suburbans that are parked now. The last one I parked has got 620,000 miles, and I put just about every one on those three Suburbans. And, and people stopped caring after Y2K didn't happen. They don't have any idea how close they came to the Dark Ages. What if the Dark Ages did happen and we ran out of electricity? I believe that if, if the people get too far out of line, there's two things that are going to happen. Occupation by China, beyond our troops coming back. And, and the lights out. If people are not prepared for that, not on how to survive, in, how you can survive in a city without electricity. It's a disastrous area. The only thing you can do is put stuff away for as long as you can to survive it. Uh, water, food, etc. If you can't eat it, wear it, or shoot it, do you really need it? But what good are your guns and bullets if your stomach is empty and your feet are bloody or frozen? You can live without air for three minutes, water for three days, and food for three weeks. So how are your priorities? So it's got to start with basic preparedness for the individual. Paranoia paralyzes. Preparation makes all that go away, whether you're in the city or in the country. But heaven help you in either spot now, because they've declared war on everybody here in the countryside here. People that have moved out of the cities to our areas are now wondering if they made a mistake. Until we take charge. You know, we've seen a lot of things happen in the last few years. People got so ticked off at the globalists and their agenda in Missoula, Montana, which is, by the way, the northwest capital for communism in the United States that they took their, their sledgehammers and their axes and these loggers went right after these clowns. And things turned around for a little while. But that's not going to happen until we the people rise up and say enough is enough. And until we do it in unison, we're not going to win. And that's why I'm praying for pain, for people to hurt enough to be able to rally around the cause. And I see that day coming soon. Michael, anything else? I agree with you there, John. One of the things that's really been bothering me in, uh, is this federal roundup of the wild horses. Uh, what people aren't realizing is by taking these wild mustangs off the land 
it's also eliminating a means of transportation for us. So, you know, it's it's in our face everywhere you look where they're throwing us further and further into slavery, and it just astounds me how people will just sit back and let it happen, like it's going to go away. It's well, here in Montana, go, I'm, I'm sorry. What's that, John? Here in Montana, um, they've put wolves in from northern Canada that have a disease called high data disease, which is transferable to human beings. These wolves are up to 220 pounds and, and six, seven, eight feet long. They're monsters, monsters. And these wolves have been killing the game in the hills and driving the rest of them down around our homes. And the bears have been going to bed hungry in the wintertime. And when they come out in the spring, they're just nastier than all get out. And the only thing left for these critters to eat is what's at the bus stop. And until children start getting eaten by these wolves and bear, I don't believe the public's going to come off their hind end and do anything. They have to suffer pain, and I've been praying for pain. I pray that no children get killed. But sooner or later, this is going to happen. And on, All right, Michael, I, I, I want to thank you way. for the call very much. Thanks so much, thank Michael. Um, John, it's interesting what you just said about the lights out and, and uh, cities and such, because just yesterday, what, today's Wednesday, so uh, Monday night, on Monday night football, the state of San Francisco 49ers, Pittsburgh Steelers in San Francisco, the stadium transformer blew up just before the game, and the lights all went out. And you had 70,000 people in one enclosed space, and it happened during the game a second time. Um, and it was interesting because they were all talking about all these contingencies. The lights don't go back on. We have to move the game to another stadium. How are we going to do And And the massive amount of dominoes in this one enclosed area, just this one relatively unimportant event. God, if something like that happens, you know, on, on a, a larger scale, oh, my God. I used to be in the Naval Research Lab. We did funny little games way back then, albeit I was a very unimportant part of it all. I was in the flight support detachment that hauled them around the sky. But, but they were doing games like that way back when, experimenting with knocking power grids out, etc., and, and, and if people want to know how it's going to come down, there's several books out there. One of the best ones is called Lights Out. But the Another one uh, that Genrich has even written a forward to is called One Second After. Both of these books are available to the militia of Montana uh, at a very decent price. Uh, and there's many other places. Of course, you've got your Amazon.com and the rest of them. But Lights Out and One Second After. If you want to know how it's going to come apart and how the gangs will... Will, will rally around their desires to pillage everything that's in the area. These are the two books that will knock your socks off and make you think the way you ought to be thinking about how serious things are. All right. And, and there's also the Twilight Zone episode incident on Maple Street where the lights went out and uh -huh. people went absolutely crazy. Um, www.militiaofmontana, militiaofmontana.com. John, I want to thank you for spending a few extra minutes this hour with us, uh, and I want to wish you and yours happy holidays. I won't say Merry Christmas because, frankly, he wasn't born on December 25th. I agree. Um, but I will say Happy New Year, and I sure hope that your visions of hope come to uh, bear fruit you know let, let's let's get those sheriffs on board amen amen and, and to you and all of yours and all the listeners out there happy holidays thank you so much friend. thanks so much john trokeman